Sir Reed for joining the Assistant Seminar today, and thanks so much, uh, Ellie Davidson, for, for joining. Uh, Ellie is a R&D lead researcher and engineer at Espresso Systems, and today she'll be talking about uh, the Marketplace for Shared Sequencing Project. Thanks, Ellie. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's really exciting to be here. Um, yeah, so we've kind of uh, recently released this blog post um, that describes uh, what we're calling a marketplace for shared sequencing. Um, and so this is, uh, instead of describing us what Espresso does as a shared sequencer, um, we're kind of, you know, describing it as a marketplace because that's actually what it really is. And in this presentation, I'll go into, um, you know, like what it is, what the problems that it's trying to solve are, um, and, you know, and how it fits into what Espresso has, has built so far. So uh, to start off with, there are kind of two parts to shared sequencing. <clears throat> so shared sequencing generally, you know, we use it to uh, to describe what it means to sequence for multiple rollups at once. In theory, you could be sequencing for multiple L1s, you could be sequencing for L3s, but, you know, generally it's, it's used in the context of L2s. Um, and so there's two parts to it. You need some way to select who is going to be in charge of the sequencing. So, you know, generally this is the proposer. Um, you need some way to select them. And then you also need some sort of finality gadget to uh, commit what it is that you sequence to make sure that it can never change in the future. So most of this presentation is just going to focus on the first one. Uh, Espresso does both of these things. But, um, but yeah, the, the marketplace part is mostly based on just the proposer assignment. So, all right, now let's dive in and kind of describe what the problem is that that we're trying to solve at Espresso and uh, what the problem shared sequencers in general are trying to solve. So uh, we have rollups, they're horizontally scaling Ethereum. This is really great. We can shard computation across a bunch of different applications. We can increase the throughput. Uh, we can also take advantage of heterogeneity. So for example, we can take advantage of nodes that are really powerful that can compute these uh, zero knowledge proofs and weaker nodes can verify those proofs. So all of this is really great. Um, you know, this is a really great ecosystem. Um, and here's kind of what this, what this looks like. So we have uh, each individual rollup. We have a few examples here. And they basically all post either a fraud proof or a ZK proof, and they post their state to the L1. Um, and so this is the kind of the, st the state of things today. Um, but the problem is that Rollups run what they call what we're going to call isolated sequencers, and what this means is that they each decide the order of their transactions all by themselves, and they don't have any knowledge of what the other rollups are doing, and they don't necessarily have knowledge of what's happening on the L1 either. So, what this means is that you get some really big drawbacks. Um, you get drawbacks in that it's very difficult to interoperate between all of these different rollups on top of Ethereum. If you want to interoperate, you essentially have to uh, you know, one rollup has to sequence transactions. It has to go all the way through to Ethereum, get finalized. That takes up like 20 minutes. Then it has to, then the other rollup has to like read from that and do the same thing. So you have very poor interoperability. Um, you also can't get what we call atomic execution, which means that you can't ever guarantee that if one transaction executes, another one definitely executes or they both fail. And these are two... Uh, potentially really desirable features that we want. And so a lot of times in the in the system, we're calling this, we have L2 fragmentation. We have these great L2s and they're really great at scaling Ethereum, but uh, their ecosystems are all very disparate between each other. Uh, so then let's now look at what the job of a sequencer is. So a sequencer is basically whoever is in charge of deciding the order of transactions. Usually in most consensus protocols, including Ethereum, this is also called the proposer. So the way that this works is users submit their transactions to some sequencer. In this picture, uh, we're showing what, what a centralized sequencer, which is what rollups today have, which is just basically a single server. Um, the centralized sequencer, they decide the order of the user's transactions and they post the state update to the L1. Uh, so there's a few things that this sequencer does. So mainly they just sequence the transactions. But the other important thing that they can do is provide uh, pre-confirmations. And these pre-confirmations are, you know, guarantees to the user that their transaction will become final on the L1 eventually. And, you know, as long as the user trusts whoever is sequencing 
this uh, these transactions, they can be they don't have to wait for finality on the L1, which is really good. For example, it would be very poor user experience if I as a user wanted to submit a transaction and then I have to wait 20 minutes to to find out if it's like you know really going to become final. Um, so a pre-confirmation gives users a very strong guarantee. It's not a 100% guarantee that their transaction will become final, but it's very strong. Uh, okay, so this is what the sequencer does. And then um, just quickly, you say, well, how how might you know you choose uh, who gets to sequence? Who gets to sequence? So you have a couple of options. So the the most natural option is some sort of like round robin or random selection approach. So this is in most consensus protocols. You'll randomly elect a proposer each round, and then that proposer is like in charge of deciding the order. You could, however, also run an auction. Um, and this auction, you know, everybody bids, whoever bids the highest price for the right to become the proposer in the consensus protocol, they win um, and they get they get the right to propose. So these, you know, past kind of three slides are just to kind of set the stage of, uh, you know, what this, uh, what this ecosystem is. Um, all right, so we kind of talked about how there is this disadvantage to isolated sequencers, this fragmentation, Interoper interoperability between all of these different L2s is difficult. Um, and so this is why we, we introduced the concept of a shared sequencer. So a shared sequencer um, is something where you have a unified party that is sequencing for all of the rollups at once. And um, it's interesting to note that this could be, this can actually be the layer one themselves. So a layer one is actually a shared sequencer, if you think about it. Um, it's just sometimes not used that way. Or this could be an external shared sequencer, like something Espresso is building, which I'll touch on later. But so yes, we introduced this shared sequencer architecture and it has really good advantages. Um, so basically, the big advantage is that you have improved interoperability and you can get these atomic transactions. If you have the same party that is deciding the ordering of transactions for rollup A and for rollup B, they can, um, they can ensure the atomic transactions. And so they can ensure that, you know, two transactions are definitely included together and that they both execute or they both fail. And so, uh, and then another point here is that if you're specifically, if you're using the layer one as your shared sequencer, this has been referred to as based sequencing in Ethereum. Um, you also get the advantage that you get all of the decentralization and security of your layer one, which is desirable. So like I said, you could use the L1 as a sequencer or you can use a separate sequencer. So this is kind of where Espresso fits in. And you can use what we're, we call a layer 1.5. So this sits between the rollups and the L1, and this layer 1.5 does two things. So it provides sequencing, um, and then it also provides data availability. Uh, now, fundamentally, this layer 1.5 actually does not need to provide both of them. You have designs that might only provide data availability, only provide ordering, but um, in Espresso's case, we, we do provide both. And later on in the talk, I'll kind of I'll discuss like why, what are the advantages of having a layer 1.5 in between? Because at first glance, it might seem, well, you're just adding this extra layer. Why don't you just use the L1? You know, it seems like there's these great advantages to just using the L1 as a shared sequencer. So what's the point of this layer 1.5? And I'll touch on that later. So, all right. So up until this point, we have isolated sequencers. They're bad because we have a lot of fragmentation. So we introduce a shared sequencer. And the shared sequencer gives us really good interoperability. But now we come back into that question, well, how do we decide who gets to propose for this shared sequencer? And you have a couple of different options. So uh, you can just run a round robin or a random election protocol. That is totally fine. And in fact, like that is what most, uh, most protocols do today. But you can also run an auction. And so auction design is where the kind of the uh is like the core idea of this marketplace for shared sequencing so you have a couple of options when you run an auction and so the most naive or like the most straw man example is that you run an auction for someone to propose for all of the rollups at once so this person uh can order the transactions across all rollups and this is really great 
um, this is good because you have, um, sorry, I'll actually back up. This is really good because you can enable atomic transactions across any rollup. You could, for example, a user could say, I have a transaction that I want to be atomically executed across 20 different rollups. Um, and you, you could enforce that because you have the same party that's sequencing and proposing for all of the rollups at once. So next, let's kind of look into a shared auction versus an isolated auction. So this is analogous to a shared sequencer versus an isolated sequencer, like we discussed before. Um, so in a sh um, an isolated auction would be an auction where people bid for the right to sequence for each individual rollup. And it's each individual, and you may have different winners that win each bid, versus the shared auction is when someone bids to sequence for this entire, all of the rollups at once. So they're kind of two extremes. Um, and here's a couple of notes. So a shared auction revenue might be higher than just the combined isolated auctions because in a shared auction, you can do these atomic transactions, you can have cross rollup DeFi logic, et cetera. And so you may actually be able to earn more revenue in a shared auction rather than like an isolated auction. But uh, you run into this big question where, what do you do with the revenue? So what we've talked about, uh, up until this point, we've said, oh, you know, having a shared sequencer is really great. But a point that I kind of purposefully did not include is, well, where does all the revenue go? So currently, rollups have their own sequencers, and they capture all of the fees from sequencing. If you have a shared sequencer that's some other party, whether it be Espresso or the L1, um, naturally, those layers all of a sudden get all of your revenue, and that's not very good. So the key idea of this marketplace design is that we want to enable the revenue to be redistributed back to rollups so that they're no they're no worse off. Hopefully they're better off, but at the very least, they're no worse off participating in a shared sequencer than they are in just you know running their own sequencer by themselves. So, but this kind of leads uh, opens this big question: well, how do you actually share the auction revenue among all of these individual rollups? If someone bids, say, $10 to to sequence for all of the rollups on the shared sequencer, like how do you decide which rollup gets what? Um, and so this is the problem that we're kind of trying to solve. And there's a lot of analogies to this problem that kind of help frame it. I think the best one is a, a music festival. So bands play at a music festival and the festival sells tickets to individuals. But obviously some bands are gonna bring in more people and more tickets than other bands. So how does the, the festival decide how much revenue to give back to each band. And the idea is that if you don't give enough revenue back to the band, they're not going to agree to play at your festival and that's not very good. But if you give too much revenue back to them, well then you're taking away revenue that maybe should have actually gone to other bands. So, um, you know, there's real life analogies to this problem. So basically here, what we're gonna do is how can we design an auction that has a few key traits? How do we design an auction that, where we get the benefits of shared sequencing, um, where we're allowing parties to sequence for multiple rollups at once, but we're doing so in a way where individual rollups are better off in the shared sequencer and they get their fair share of revenue. So first, let's do kind of a, a, a straw man attempt. We'll have two, two options for, for people to bid on. So bidders can either bid on the whole bundle of all of the rollups at once, or they can bid on each individual bundles. And we choose whichever option generates the most revenue. So for example, if someone bids $20 on the entire bundle of all of the rollups, and the sum of all of the bids for the individual rollups only sums to say uh, like 13, obviously we're going to choose the the bid for all of the bundles because it generates more revenue. It generates $7 more revenue. And then when we decide to reallocate the revenue, we'll say, okay, so this bundle one, the bundle for all of the rollups one, but we're gonna take the, the bids for the individual rollups and we're gonna use that to determine the value of each rollup. So in this example, the entire bundle was worth 20, but individual rollups like A was worth three, B was, B was worth $2, C was worth $3, et cetera. So we're going to uh, find the proportions of that to the total, you know, find out how much each rollup is worth proportionally to each other and then apply that to the 
Uh, but there, there is unfortunately a problem with this. And the problem is that rollups might just artificially bid high just so they can get more revenue. So for example, let's say A says, okay, I know I'm only worth $3, but if I just bid $10 for myself, as long as I don't bid enough that the entire, as long as I don't bid too much where I actually have to pay that $10, I just get more of the revenue. So like, why wouldn't I do this? And this is called shill, shill bidding. And shill bidding prevents you efficiently allocating all of the revenue back to rollups because you're not getting accurate reflections of how much each individual rollup is worth. And the point of the auction is not only to decide the proposer, which is important, but it's to also determine the worth of each rollup. And you determine the worth of each rollup based on how much people want to bid for the right to sequence for that rollup. So obviously, if someone is shill bidding, that's preventing this efficient allocation. So yes, let's say that a shill bids. They say, oh, I'm going to shill bid for $10, even though I'm only worth three. Well, the result is then that the total bundle still ends up winning. So the bundle is worth $20. It still has the most, uh, it's still worth the most. So the bundle ends up winning, but A gets too much revenue redistributed to it. So that's not good. But then you can go even further and say, well, what if both A and B both shill bid and they both say that they're worth $10 when they really aren't? Well, all of a sudden, now the bundle of all rollups is not worth the most. And so what happens is now that each individual rollup gets sequenced by itself and you lose, uh, you lose the ability for the shared sequencing. Because if you're sequencing rollups by themselves, then we're kind of back to the current state today where we don't have any shared sequencers. So this is, this is not good. Well, what do we do to solve this problem? So we can allow a combinatorial auction. So instead of just having the option to bid on either all of the rollups at once or only individual rollups, you, um, someone can bid on any combination of rollups that they think is valuable. Uh, so let's look at an example. So proposers can bid on arbitrary bundles. Uh, so this is a combinatorial problem. And if you have shill bidding, you risk being excluded from the winning bundle. And I'll kind of go into this on the next slide. And just optional, um, you can also burn part of the bids if you want to disincentivize shill bidding, but that's or orthogonal to, to the design of the auction. Um, all right, so we have, uh, we have these three bundles here. So we have the bundle of all of the rollups like we had before. We have the bundles, uh, or we have the singleton bundles of each individual rollup. And then we have this bundle of only three rollups. So let's look at the shill bidding situation. Let's say A and B, like last time, they um, they overbid themselves and they bid two more than they're worth. Well, what's going to actually happen is that A and B will be excluded from shared sequencing, but the other three rollups will still win. Like they'll still be included together. So what we're going to um, have happen is that you end up with the winning the winning combination is going to be three things. It's going to be the bundle of three rollups, uh, C, D, and E. And then the A bundle and the B bundle just by themselves. And the reason is, is because that is the revenue maximizing combination. So um, in this case, oh, I should have I should have put a numbers example on this slide, but basically uh, you say which combination earns you the most revenue, you just take the sum of all of the bids. And since a combination of, of many bundles will likely be have a higher bid than the sum of its individual parts. Uh, you end up with this kind of combination. So um, yeah, essentially the point is that uh, this prevents shill bidding from messing up the redistribution of allocation because if a roll-up shill bids on itself and bids too high, it basically just gets excluded from the shared sequencing. But you could argue that actually maybe shill bidding is not the end of the world. So why might rollups want to shill bid? Well, they might have a view that they want to make a minimum amount of revenue for their rollup blocks before they allow someone else to sequence for them. So shill bidding actually can function as a reserve price. And uh, in this model, every rollup would, instead of shill bidding on themselves, they would post a reserve price. And it says, if no one bids more than this minimum price for me, I will just, I will just sequence for myself. Um, and in this way, you know, maybe shill bidding isn't such a problem. So the design 
of this marketplace is what we're calling ad hoc shared sequencing. And the marketplace is that you're allowing rollups to sell their for block proposal rights by each slot. So uh, let's, if we work through an example, I'm a rollup, I set my minimum bid price, my reserve price to, price to be $10. If no one wants to bid more than $10 for either my, my individual rollup or my rollup as a part of a larger combination, then I get to sequence for myself. Um, and then I obviously, you know, get all of that $10 back. But if someone says, oh, hey, I'll actually buy the right to sequence you for $11, you know, then someone else can buy your sequencing rights. Um, but there's a couple of there's a couple of caveats to, to this problem. So uh, the first one is that this is a combinatorial auction, which means that if you have, you know, if you only have like five rollups, that's fine because you don't have that many possible combinations. But if you have a hundred rollups or a thousand rollups on the shared sequencer, this very quickly becomes intractable to like find the optimal allocation. So what do you do? Well, the solution is that you can find just a good enough allocation. You say, okay, maybe I run some sort of an optimizer for a minute, two minutes, and I output the best allocation that I have found within that time span. And then because all of the bids in the network are public, someone else can come and offer a better allocation if they find one. And if, you know, if someone finds a better allocation, then maybe you give them some sort of like finders fee. Um, but this is basically how we can get around this intractable problem of having a combinatorial auction where, where you could have like thousands upon thousands of possible combinations. The other part of this is that you need to run the auction um, pretty far ahead in advance. And there's a few reasons for this. Um, so you have two parts. One is that you mainly want to run the auction ahead of time in advance just for sort of economic incentive properties. So if you run um, the, the right to propose a block, and you, but you have to decide whether or not you want to propose that block very far in advance, you don't actually know what your, your actual revenue will be from that block. So this is different than like proposer builder separation in Ethereum today. Instead of bidding on the actual revenue you'll make in that block, you're bidding on the revenue that you expect to make. And maybe this has some good economic properties. But there's also some more technical reasons why you have to run this auction very like very far in advance. And one is that you need to have ample time to solve this combinatorial problem. You want to give ample time not only for one party to solve it, but also for other people to potentially post better, better combinations. And then two, you need to make sure that your consensus protocol has plenty of time to know about the results of the auction. So you don't want to end up in the case where um, a party wins the auction, but the consensus protocol just hasn't had time to learn about that yet, and therefore the consensus protocol doesn't properly um, properly let that person propose. So you could, you could end up with an example where I won the auction, but the consensus protocol doesn't know about it, and so they reject the block that I propose. You don't want that either. So there's kind of economic reasons you might want to run this lottery, or sorry, this auction uh, really far in advance, and then there's some technical reasons as well. Um, and then as I mentioned here, if you run the auction far ahead of time in advance, the bidders don't know the exact value that they're going to make from their block that they propose. Um, and so they're, they're bidding based on the expected value. This can have some nice economic properties, but one of the downsides is that the expected value does not change very often. And so you're just going to end up with everybody submitting the same bid every single time. Um, and then you just end up with the same people winning the the lot or the auction every single time and that's not very good you end up with like centralized builders um you know maybe one builder ends up getting a monopoly you don't want that so to address this problem we're going to take this auction and we're actually going to run a lottery so we're going to introduce uh, a little bit of randomness into the selection um so here's what the lottery looks like instead of um, you know, potential builders submitting bids into the system, you're going to buy lottery tickets. Each ticket is going to have a set price. And this price can be dynamically adjusted over time. So after each round of the auction, you can say, oh, a lot of lottery tickets were sold. So I'm going to raise the price for the next auction. Or if very few lottery tickets were sold, you can lower the price. But all of these lottery tickets for a single auction are the same price. Um, and instead of bidding, you basically decide how many lottery tickets you want to buy. And because there's a fixed number of lottery tickets, you know your chances of winning uh, of winning the auction based on 
um, how many tickets you buy. So if I buy 10 tickets and there's 100 tickets, I know that probably or in expectation over time, I have a 10% chance of winning, um, of winning the lottery. And so in this way, we introduce this extra amount of randomness into, into the protocol, and this uh, kind of forces you to have different proposers in the protocol instead of always having like the same proposer. And then, um, yeah, and so really quickly to wrap it up, we have, uh, so we have this design. Our whole goal in the beginning was we wanna, we wanna have this auction that allows rollups to sell their block space, but only to sell their block space if they're gonna make more revenue than they would by not selling it. That's the goal. Our goal is that rollups are always better off by joining a shared sequencer than they are by sequencing by themselves. Well, how do we solve that problem? We have this auction where people bid, uh, rollups can set a uh, reserve price to ensure that they get a minimum amount of revenue each round. Um, and then any extra revenue made through the auction is redistributed to rollups. So the key properties of this are that like revenue is redistributed is redistributed to the rollup itself. So that's our goal. But how might then you could also say, well, how is this actually implemented in consensus? And so this is actually where I spend most of my time. I spend most of my time at Espresso working on our consensus protocol. Um, so how is this implemented in consensus? Well instead of a round robin leader election, you're going to have, uh, you're replacing it with this auction. So that's the first step. The second step is um, doing, so Ethereum calls this execution tickets. And this is instead of, um, you know, proposers being, this is basically exactly what I described. Instead of you randomly electing proposers um, or doing a round robin, uh, you know, proposers are elected through this auction. Um, and another part of this is that you expect the people who bid in this auction or who buy lottery tickets are going to be very sophisticated. So this is a, a big difference between um, many consensus protocols and kind of this marketplace design. A lot of the times in consensus protocols, leaders, because leaders are like round robin, they're not always expected to be very sophisticated parties. They're expected to usually be the same level of sophistication as a regular validator in the network. And in fact, they're the same they're all of the same set. So the all like the proposer is chosen from the set of validators in the network. This is not the case in this new design. In this new design, you have validators who vote in the network and you have proposers. And those two sets are not necessarily, they're not necessarily the same. They may have overlap, but they don't have to. Um, so that's kind of how we, we implement this into consensus. And then uh, the other part is, well, censorship resistance. If you have a common proposer across all of the rollups, um, you could argue that you might get sense, some censorship. Some, uh, so for example, let's say you have a rollup that often has a lot of like sanctioned transactions in it. Like that's its value prop is that it's like a privacy rollup. It offers, you know, like shielding, uh, like transaction shielding and, and anything like that. And let's say that a lot of proposers don't want to include that rollup block because they don't want to touch anything that might be sanctioned. Well, in that case, a rollup like that, if you have one shared proposer across the entire shared sequencer, that, that rollup is gonna you know, be censored and it's not gonna be included. But with this marketplace design, since you can have multiple proposers, um, you can actually have you know, proposers who want to propose, propose for other rollups, and then you can have proposers that are totally fine you know, sequencing for a sanctioned rollup or sanctioned transactions, and they can still propose for that rollup. So you get better censorship resistance because the um, the parties that are proposing for each rollup are more aligned with the incentives of that rollup, rather than saying one party has to sequence for everybody, and if that party isn't aligned with with all of the rollups, then like too bad for the rollups. Um, and then the final part is that the key change from that this requires from our consensus protocol standpoint is that now we need to support multiple proposers. So most, well, not most, you have consensus protocols that don't have leaders, but most consensus protocols today probably run on a leader-based paradigm. You have one leader who proposes a block, everybody else votes on it, et cetera. Well, now we need to support multiple proposers, and that is, an, in my opinion, a very like interesting research space. So there's a lot of um, other consensus protocols that don't have leaders, or rather, 
maybe they have leaders, but the leaders are chosen after the fact. So you could look at DAGs. DAGs are probably uh, the most common, like well-known form of a consensus protocol that doesn't have explicit leaders. Um, and so I think here we can actually use a lot of the ideas from DAG designs and kind of port them over to our proposal or to our consensus protocol without making our pr protocol a full, a full DAG. So that's kind of the consensus view of the lottery. And I'll wrap it up with uh, a couple of further, further thoughts. So there's some open questions that I didn't really touch on here. Um, the first is, well, have we actually fixed the shill bidding problem? So, you know, we say, oh, shill bidding functions as a reserve price. But one thing I didn't mention is that it doesn't completely solve the shill bidding problem. So a roll up might set a reserve price, but they still might be incentivized to shill bid a little bit to see if they can get like a little bit of extra revenue. And it'll might just depend on what the what the bids are for that particular round. So we haven't actually completely fixed the shill bidding problem. Um, the other thing is, well, what if you have some sort of a tight knit community? So for example, there's a lot of rollups like super chains or hyper chains. Um, you know, maybe they actually want to participate in the shared sequencer as a group. You know, maybe they find that they don't really have a lot of economic value being sequenced by themselves. So they're just always going to participate as a group. Um, that could also be something else that happens. Um, thirdly, is this compatible with based sequencing? So based sequencing has been kind of a hot topic in like the Ethereum community lately. Um, and the short answer to that is yes, although I won't really go into why, why that is. Um, but, but yes, this can be 100% compatible with based sequencing. And then the final question is, how often do you run the, the lottery? So running the lottery can be, <clears throat> um, can be a bit complex because you have to solve this combinatorial problem. And even though we're time boxing the, the combinatorial problem, you know, to be a couple of minutes, it's still like a complex thing to run. So um, you, you don't want to run the lottery for every single, um, every single block that you propose. Instead, you want to run the lottery for, say, every 100 blocks. And then you use the randomization to like randomize each individual proposer. But you also don't want to run the lottery too infrequently because you want people to be able to update their bids and, you know, properly reflect what like the accurate price of each roll up. So that's a lot for some further thoughts. But now basically just want to say like the takeaways. That was a lot of um, a lot of talking. The takeaways are basically we're building a marketplace for shared sequencing. How are we building a marketplace? We're using a combinatorial lottery to efficiently decide uh, who gets to sequence for rollups. You can view this as an auction um, and then just kind of adding a little bit of randomization on top of it as a lottery. But the core idea is that it's an auction. Um, and then finally, the main part of this idea is that rollups are always better off participating in this system than they are being um, sequencing just for themselves. So like that's the key value prop here is that Rollups are always going to make as much revenue or more revenue in a shared sequencer with this design than they're going to make, um, you know, by themselves. So uh, that's the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and would love to. Ha if anybody has any questions, that would be uh, be great. Hey, yeah, great. I great um, great presentation. I really enjoyed it. I had um a bit of a question on so when you say like atomic like execution or inclusion mm -hmm. um you said like you know you can maybe include a batch where you have a transaction roll up one and roll up two and they're either both executed or both fail um is that including you know like in the evm you have transactions that revert um mm -hmm. is that including that case or is a transaction that reverts considered like included and so like like basically are you guaranteeing just the inclusion or the actual successful execution of the the transaction yeah that is a really really good question um so a transaction that reverts would be considered only atomic inclusion not atomic execution and the um so there's a so like Espresso or any shared sequencer can offer atomic inclusion pretty easily. The difficult part is going from inclusion to execution. So there's two ways you can do this. One is that the proposer is going to have to post collateral and basically say, 
if they post something that doesn't atomically execute, they're slashed for some like very large amount. And the key point is that you need to slash them for a lot. Like they need to post quite a lot of collateral because you want to make sure that they don't ever make more money by breaking their promise than they do by keeping their promise. The other solution is once at some point in the future, we have real time proving. Uh, if you have real time proving, you can um, you know, prove within the like within the time span of a single block that the execution is correct. And therefore, you actually don't have to trust, um, you don't have to rely on economic collateral. But right now, we don't have uh, real-time proving. So you get atomic execution by basically requiring proposers to post collateral and then slashing them if they don't. So could you explain one more time how the real-time proving removes the need for economic collateral? Um, yes. Yeah. So actually, I think that that's a good point. It might not entirely remove the need for economic collateral, but the um, but the idea is that if you had, if you have real time proving, um, you could actually, so actually I'm going to back up. So a key part of this is that the nodes in the consensus protocol do not execute transactions. So if the nodes in the consensus protocol were executing transactions, you could have the consensus protocol enforce atomic execution because the nodes would not vote for, they wouldn't vote to sequence a transaction if it didn't like atomically execute. Um, but we don't have that in a sequencing protocol. So with real-time proving, um, essentially you would do a proof. Um, can, you would you would facilitate mes message passing in between the different um, the different rollups, and it would basically look you would basically enforce the execution when you or the atomic execution at the rollup level. So I'm not I don't think I'm describing this very well, but the flow is that a transaction goes to a sequencer. The sequencer sequences it, and then after that, the rollup interprets what the sequencer has done, and it executes the block. So if you have real-time proving, um, you can basically have it so that a rollup will only execute their block if they receive a valid proof of the other rollups state. So if you have a transaction that's atomic between two rollups, um, your rollup will only execute their side of the transaction if um, the like the state proof is also included from the other rollup is also included. But to do that in a timely manner, you need maybe not real time proving, but you need like fast proving. Um, you could technically do it without fast proving, but then it's, and that, and that is done today, but it's not a really great user experience because, um, you, you know, you have to do this message passing. Um, I will point out that there is this project that Polygon is working on called AgLayer that's basically doing this. So they are they are not using real-time proving, but they are basically facilitating the message passing between different rollups so that a rollup, when the rollup is executing its block, it's taking as an input the proven state of another rollup, and therefore it's only executing its block if the proven state of the other rollup um, is in fact correct. So yeah does that that's a little yeah. bit of a it's, it is complicated but i'm roughly following it i'll say i, I don't think i'm going to get past the point of roughly following it so <laughs> yeah so sorry oh, oh. um is the uh if the validators aren't you know executing the transactions which makes sense right mm -hmm. so are how does the system guarantee that those transactions are paying fees at all ah that's a very very good point so there's a uh, a few different p, f p or sorry fee structures you can do. Um, so one of the fee structures is that you can have the uh, you have one fee transaction or a very low number of fee transactions for the whole block. So the idea is that whoever builds the block would take the fees and the fees would pay directly who builds the block. They would directly pay the proposer. This could actually be abstracted, you know, so like the user doesn't actually have to worry about that but their fees pay whoever is proposing the block. And then the proposer has to include a single transaction in their proposer that properly pays the network. And the network does execute that single fee transaction. So that's basically the idea is that you kind of abstract the individual transaction fees away and you put them into one big fee and the network does actually execute that fee. So then that, that would then assume then that the builder is able to guarantee that those transactions are paying fees, right? Or is somehow able to do that? Uh, yeah, so the builder is expected that they, um, they're they gonna have to execute the transactions, yeah. 
So that's also how they determine, like, if you get atomic execution, like, they do have to execute them. But the idea is that they're a very sophisticated party who can do that, whereas the validators in the network are very unsophisticated and, you know, can't reasonably do that quickly. Uh, it seems like there's a number of questions, so I open the queue. Patrick, you're up next if you want to ask. Um, so I guess, like, uh, in terms of, like, how, if you could go back to the slide, maybe, where you talk about the individual, seat, like, uh, roll-ups fitting into the sequencer, um, like, any one of the slides where you see them all together, kind of. Oh, like... Uh, like, one of those is fine, yeah. Like, yeah, maybe, like, um, this one. So I, I maybe have a, a dumb question around some of this because I, I, I think it, the research changes so much that I, and I'll, I'm not I'm never sure exactly what the the view is on some of this. So with a shared sequencer, do these rollups have to have like basically would need to pick Espresso as like the exclusive shared sequencer that they would use? Um, or you yeah. mentioned like that there is like a based sequencing compatibility, like or mm -hmm. like so you could augment whatever maybe ETH is doing in terms of its sequencing? Yeah. Or is there some view where like because you mentioned like Polygon, for example, has the egg layer, which is some would say a competitor to what you guys are doing um, mm -hmm. in terms of like having a shared sequencing. So like how do you guys think about trying to corral potentially disparate yeah. projects? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's a that's a good question. Um, so a few points. So um, a rollup technically does not have to choose a single sequencer. And this is actually what exists today. So right now with centralized sequencers, um, the centralized sequencer does most of the sequencing, but someone can also forcibly like inject a transaction directly to the L1 and the centralized sequencer has to respect that. So fundamentally rollups don't have to choose a single one but there's a really big trade-off if you choose more than one so if you choose a single sequencer or or if you choose a main sequencer so like it's one thing to have like a backup sequencer in case one fails but um if you choose a single a main sequencer you get a really good property of fast finality so if you trust that sequencer and they're the only one who can ever sequence for you then once that sequencer says something is final, it's not going to ever be reorged, even if it hasn't made it to the L1 yet. But if you have multiple sequencers, then you run into, you don't really get this fast finality. Because um, if I'm a user and I submit my transaction to Espresso, but the rollup is using like some other, uh, you know, other project too, um, well, then I don't know the order that my transaction is actually in when it hits the L1. So my execution might be different than what I think it is. So fundamentally, rollups don't have to choose a single one, but really for the best user experience, they do. Now, to your other other point, um, ag layer is, I'm actually really interested in the ag layer project. And the ag layer is actually very com complementary. So the ag layer actually has um, a shared sequencing component. So the way I understand it, at least, is that a shared sequencer would, like Espresso, would still sequence the transactions. It's just that the ag layer would come in afterwards and um, and do all of its proof aggregation and like validity checking and like stuff like that. So um, I think that the two are actually quite quite compatible. Um, and then as far as base sequencing in, in Ethereum, um, Espresso can is compatible with base sequencing. And what that means is at its definition, based sequencing means that you're allowing Ethereum proposers to propose for your rollup. That's like the definition that Justin Drake, um, who proposed it in the first place, has landed on. And Espresso does that. So I didn't, I, could, I didn't really go over this in the slides. But what Espresso does is that they allow the L1 proposer this uh, right of first refusal, which is basically um, whoever wins. So no matter who wins the auction. The L1 proposer always has the right to purchase the right to to propose that block for the amount that won plus you know some extra fee. And so in this way, the L1 proposer can always choose to participate in sequence for Espresso if they want to, and therefore Espresso is based. You can get interoperability between the L1, um, but the main difference is that you don't necessarily have an L1 sequencer every single Espresso block. Is the difference between like the espresso implementation and maybe what we call what we're calling like vanilla based sequencing which is what justin originally described so i guess as a summary to answer your question um no rollups don't have to have a single sequencer but they probably should because otherwise you get very poor user experience um 
So, and as far as like corralling rollups, um, yeah, it's kind of like a network effect thing. Um, obviously we hope that like Espresso will have a good network effect. And that's one of the really big drivers behind us. This, this marketplace design is that, you know, rollups should always be better off in this design than they would be elsewhere. So like, why not join, you know, join this marketplace? That's kind of the idea. Um, okay. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how that plays because I know a lot of people have said the exact same thing about their shared layer. Yeah. And so like, it'll be, <laughs> it'll be interesting to see how, how the network, like it almost seems like you have these network of network effects rather than just like one per other. But I'm, I'm very yeah. curious to see, obviously everyone's pushing like unique functionality and like interesting enhancements mm -hmm. that like being in their sort of shared consortium mm -hmm. provides. So I'm very interested yeah. to see, but thank you for answering the question. Sorry, that was like well, three or four questions bumbled. Yeah, and um, and one one also note too is that you um you can choose different sequencers for different blocks. So, so the problem really comes if you have a single yeah. rollup block that's using two different sequencers. But you actually yeah. are okay if you say, oh, on even blocks I'm going to use espresso, and odd blocks I'm going to use someone else. That's actually okay because you know who's like you only have one party who's sure. in charge of sequencing With at a time. And the hope there would be that you could potentially like incorporate the composability of maybe other sets of rollups into your rollup. Mm -hmm. That would be the idea to use yeah. those like, well, okay. Got yeah. Well, sense. and the other thing, I mean, this is kind of an open, definitely like an open debate in the community is how often do you really need different kind of uh, composability? So composability with like Ethereum is great, but do you need it every single block? Maybe not. And maybe if you don't need it every single block, some blocks you choose to, you know, use totally. like a base sequencing and then other blocks you don't and maybe get cheaper sequencing because you you don't need it i mean that's a very open question but yeah i've got like a, a long list of questions but i'm just going to ask one uh that i have scribbled down and see if anybody else has more when you said espresso gives the right of first refusal to the ethereum uh the l1 node for shared sequencing what what type of incentive do you think that creates in the market because doesn't that mean that if somebody's bidding on the economic value of uh sequencing that slot or that lottery number um and they don't know what the value will be since we're sort of doing the lottery in advance doesn't that mean that the ethereum node at the layer one level gets to see what the value is of it and then decide whether or not they want to pay more for it so do you just have to pay a large enough fee or give some reward to the person that won the lottery and then got kicked out or how do you handle that incentive um yeah so that it's a good question and i would say it's like that's something that we're very actively thinking about um i think there's a couple there's a couple of ideas so in the in the ideal future we would actually want to just let the ethereum l1 proposer participate in the lottery like everybody else the problem is that ethereum proposers are only known like 32 blocks in advance and you have to run this lottery more than that and like longer than that in advance so they can't reasonably actually participate in the lottery but in the long run, they should just like participate like anybody else. And therefore you don't get this problem that, that you said. In the short term, yeah, this is kind of, this is kind of a, a problem, but the idea is maybe that, you know, the Ethereum, the Ethereum proposer would, I guess the hope is that the bids are act accurately reflecting the value of the rollups. And if they're act accurately reflecting the value of the rollups, then the Ethereum L1 proposer might not actually want to bid more. Like they'll own, because they'll have to pay this extra fee. And they're only going to pay that extra fee if they can actually extract like that much extra value. And they'll only be able to extract that much extra value if they're doing some sort of like L1, L2 interoperability that the regular proposers can't. So, that doesn't entirely like solve answer your question. Um, I guess the answer is like we're, this is something we're actively thinking about it. But in the long term, if once you know Ethereum proposers can just be known really far in advance through like secret single leader election, um, then they'll just participate like everybody else. Cool. One one other question that I, I have. Uh, Aaron, just to interrupt you, I think Josh has had a question for a bit. Um, Josh, I don't know if you want to ask your question. I think Josh like dropped and then maybe rejoined right when you asked that. Um, I got confused because I tried to open the queue, but then it seemed to have disappeared, which I think is because we all unmuted at some point and I don't like the queue anymore. <laughs> Sorry, I had to go take up my order each order, but my question was, uh, can the same fragmentation that exists with L2s uh, mm -hmm. also exist with like many L1.5s? Yeah, so yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, and yes, there's a possibility. 
Uh, obviously, if you have a lot of them, that's definitely a possibility. Um, I think the idea is that it'll be kind of similar to the effects of a lot of like layer ones where, yeah, you have multiple layer ones and maybe those aren't as interoperable as we would like between them, but they kind of have like strong enough ecosystems among them that it's not like, I guess, well, I, I shouldn't maybe say that though, because like it would be great if L1s were actually more interoperable. So I don't want to say that it's okay that they're not interoperable, um, but maybe the idea, the idea is that it won't be so bad. Okay, I think on my honest opinions are that I think the hope is that hopefully it's espresso, but probably like a couple of shared sequencers will win out in the end is probably the idea. So you'll probably have like maybe between one to three that win out. And if you only have a few, like a really small number, then maybe that's like, okay. Um, but yeah, I, I actually do, do agree that like, if we end up with a hundred shared sequencers, then have we really solved a problem? But um, hopefully that's not the case. I don't know. I don't really have a good answer to that if I'm being honest off the top of my head. Then uh, Jacob, before you go, I think Yulin has one more question as well that he asked in the chat. Yeah, just, uh, just wondering if this, uh, what you presented is a proposal or already running software uh, with uh, certain R2s? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. So we currently implemented, we have a shared sequencer that does not have this marketplace design. So the current implementation that we have on testnet just has like a, a randomly elected leader, like most consensus protocols. And that leader is in charge of um, sequencing for all of the rollups at once. Um, so that's our current implementation. But right now we are actively like coding. Well, I'm, I'm personally finishing up the planning stages and then we're like st literally starting like next week, we're actively coding to start on this marketplace design. So the hope is that we'll have a test net for it, uh, hopefully within a few months. And, and we do also have like actual roll up projects that are that that are on our test net um, as well. Yeah. I think Jacob and then Matt are up next. Yeah, I had a question around <clears throat> since a lot of these shared sequencing layers are trying to have this like network effect. What are the technical attributes that you think are really important to attract certain subsets of applications? You know, you can attract like a lot of applications, but if they're not in these groups, they're not gonna wanna talk to each other anyways, and you won't yeah. have a network effect to them. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think, well, at least from the consensus protocol side, which is where I spend most of my time, a really, really big focus of us has been high throughput and low latency, which is the focus of like every consensus protocol. But um, we've put a lot of effort into getting really high throughput because we also offer data availability. So I think one of the things we have seen in the ecosystem is that, um, you know, rollups just, they just want a lot of throughput. Well, they want data to be very cheap and you get cheap data by having like really high throughput. And so if we can be a network that just has really high throughput, a lot of rollups will just want to be part of that. And we get like network effects from that. Um, the, the other part is low latency. So we specifically, um, our, our consensus protocol is called hot shot. It's based on the hot stuff to protocol. Um, which is a linear based protocol and um, it gets very good finality. So a pretty fast latency, obviously the latency depends on how much data you have in the network and also your geo distribution of your nodes. Um, but in our latest benchmarking that we've done, we um, are able to get like one second block times and it takes two, two or it takes two rounds. Just cause our, pipe, our protocol is like pipeline, but basically in a summary, we can get about two seconds to commit a block. Um, under good conditions, assuming that like, you know, the proposer is online and they don't miss their slot. Um, and what we found is that that's also really important for rollups. So uh, I guess the idea to answer your question is the most important parts of us have seemed to just be have really like a really performant consensus protocol. And that really is what most pro like most rollups seem to want. Because um, having a performant consensus protocol that's also fast gives you like cheap data availability and you get I mean, obviously having a fast, faster confirmation times than Ethereum is really powerful. So um, yeah, I suppose, I suppose hopefully that's an okay answer. Uh, my question is, 
Can you go over the effects of a sequencer that goes offline or mm -hmm. is corrupted? And can yeah. you compare if there's a difference between uh, base sequencer and shared sequencer in this case? Uh, yeah. So first off, off, I'd say that base sequencers can also be shared sequencers, so they can be the same thing. Um, <laughs> And, but yeah, if a sequencer goes offline, so I'll talk specifically in Espresso. Um, you have a couple of scenarios. So in a regular consensus protocol where you only have one proposer that proposes for everybody, if they go offline, um, you know, the protocol is still safe, but you lose, you lose like your fast finality. So you might have to wait like 30 seconds or like for the next block or whatever. And that's not really good, but it, so you're lo you're losing liveness a little bit. But if there's like no safety violations, if you have multiple proposers, um, it's actually kind of cool because you can still maintain liveness. So if just one of those proposers goes offline, um, that's fine because the rest of them are still online and the rest of them can still like get their block committed. Um, so it's actually kind of nice because you can you can still continue to make progress even if one proposer is offline. Um, as for malicious behavior, I would say, you know, our protocol follows just your standard Byzantine fault tolerant model. So we we have we tolerate one third um, one third percentage of the stake to be um, an adversary. Um, specifically, we have a bribery model, which I could go into if that's interesting. But um, yeah, I'd say as far as like Byzantine stuff goes, um, you know, the the model our consensus protocol is like just as secure as, you know, any other BFT consensus protocol, um, like the finality gadget in Ethereum or anything like that. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that like your kind of end to end latency for acceptance or like finalization was around like two seconds. Yeah. What are your opinions on the user experience of some a system like espresso versus a centralized sequencer because like if you look at existing rollups right now yeah the the user confirmation time is like really you know, short. zero essentially yeah. it's like you know probably uh, you know 100 milliseconds to like send your thing to the you mm -hmm. know whatever to the sequencer um now of course there's obvious drawbacks with having a centralized sequencer you know you're trusting that person like if they have failures you have an outage things like that but like during the happy path normal case that like most l2s are operating in today that gives the user experience a phenomenal essentially normal web 2 user experience of interacting with stuff so like do you expect pushback from users when l2s kind of switch from a centralized sequencer to something like espresso yeah uh this is a really really great question so this is something that um it wasn't relevant to the presentation, but uh, there's this idea of pre-confirmations. And um, so there has this idea going around, and this it's not a new idea, but it's kind of becoming repopularized, where basically the proposer of the of like Espresso or any protocol can offer those 100 millisecond pre-confirmations. And as long as they, they propose and they get their block committed, uh, then they're honored. So the idea is that you the user could actually still get those 100 like millisecond pre-confirmations um from the from the proposers of their slot now there's slightly different trust assumptions than like in centralized sequencers today so you do have the assumption that um the block actually needs to get committed and so that means the proposer needs to make sure that they propose their block on time and also that the network is not in some asynchronous state where you know nodes can't vote so there's a some there are some slightly extra assumptions going on there but i think if we look in practice um those are those are pretty reasonable so um you do run the risk if you have like an asynchronous period and under that under that circumstance well then it's too unfortunate for the user um you know the network won't commit their block but if a proposer is honest then and they're proposing their block within a timely manner then uh, they do have a good amount of control over getting their block committed, um, which is important. Now, there also are some kind of interesting plays on the specific consensus protocol, and depending on how that works, because like some consensus protocols, um, 
So I will say like we have a pipeline consensus protocol and if you're pipelining, you require two blocks to commit, but those two blocks have um, different proposers. So it is potential that, you know, if, uh, if um, one, like you propose honestly, but then the next proposer doesn't propose, you know, oh, maybe your, your block gets reorged. Um, however, I'll caveat with saying that that was a problem with hot stuff one, but that's not a problem with hot stuff two, which we have recently switched to in our protocol. Um, but I guess this goes to say that basically the proposer of each block can still offer those 100 millisecond pre-confirmations. You have slightly different different trust assumptions, but um, you should still be able to get the same user experience for like the end user. Oh yeah, I want to be respectful of your time because I know we're already three minutes over, yeah. but I have more questions than I see Megan is behind me with another question. Um, um, I, I have plenty of time. I'm happy to stay like if people- right. I, have at least, I have at least two more questions. So I'll ask one and then get behind Megan in line. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the questions I had, I don't, or is not clear to me. When you're running like this, there's obviously like an exponential process or algorithm you'd have to run in order to figure out what the- most profitable block would be you could mine across some random in uh, uh, layer twos or rollups. But when you don't actually know what is in them, I, I see how that makes perfect sense when it comes to these are the transactions that are coming from each of these rollups. How can mm -hmm. I sequence them most uh, profitably? But when it comes to just there's an expected value from them, how do you actually run that calculation? I'm just sort of uh, having a hard time imagining what that looks like, whether it's just, well, I probabilistically say here were all the transactions run it based off of if I could have proposed at some random slot at the same time yesterday or what you end up doing in that case? Um, yeah, probably similar to what you what you described. So the when when parties decide how much that they're going to bid in the auction or how many lottery tickets they're going to buy, they're, they'll basically say like, they'll probably end up running like a simulation that says, oh, if I built blocks now, how much like of the transactions that I know exist for like the current block being proposed, how much would I have made? And I'll set my bid accordingly. And they'll probably do this over a course of time. So they'll say, okay, over the past month, on average, I make $20 from like, from simulating this like sequencing. So I'll bid $19, you know, as an expected value in the auction. Um, but but yeah, to your point, I think it's, it's gonna be just like simulation and seeing how much you make on average and, and it's gonna adjust. It's not gonna be completely accurate. Um, but, but, it, but it'll be up to the people who are submitting the bids to, to decide how they want to calculate what that is. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Market mechanism cures all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Ellie. Thanks. I've enjoyed this conversation so far. I just had a question for, um, for protocols such as like OP used by like base mm -hmm. and OP stack. I am familiar with their sequencing protocol also including like multiple components like a batcher that actually does the compression and then the proposer which confirms the uh, new Merkle root after the transactions that are in the included block are executed. Um, in the instance of Espresso where um, sequencing might be a bit more fragmented across multiple machines, how does the protocol ensure that those um, those end state Merkle roots being posted by the proposer are consistent with what is currently being like, especially if it's kind of almost like execution is kind of being run on um, in different execution environments, right? And so they're not necessarily aware of each other. How does it manage that so that they don't have like conflicting state, I guess? Um, yeah, okay. So I think a couple of points are uh, so any shared sequencer, not just Espresso, kind of introduces what we're calling this derivation pipeline. Um, and so normally in a centralized sequencer, the centralized sequencer actually, like, before they even sequence transactions, they, like, filter out transactions that don't pay fees, that don't, um, maybe that revert, like, et cetera. Um, and so where as Espresso is sequencing and they don't execute, so the, so Espresso actually, the, or the rollup has to actually do those things after the sequencing instead of before. So when I say paying fees, there's two kinds of fees. There's like the sequencing fee that you're paying for your data to be on the network, and then you have your gas fees. So Espresso or any shared sequencer is aware of the sequencing fee, but they're not aware of the gas fees. Um, so it's very possible that you might have a transaction that like pays its sequencing fee properly, but then runs out of gas or something like that. Um, 
But to, to your question, the way it works is basically that espresso sequences and then the rollup has this derivation pipeline and that would either be like a committee of rollup nodes or um, it could even be like a single node because it's, it's not a trusted, um, there's no trust assumptions. Like you can prove whether or not they followed the protocol. Um, so basically some node after espresso sequences would run this derivation pipeline. The pipeline would take what espresso sequences, it would turn it into a rollup block it would execute it, it would calculate the, the state root, and it would like batch it and it would post it on chain. So like in, in terms of OP, um, I actually was not the one who worked on Espresso's OP integration. So hopefully I, what I'm saying is somewhat accurate. Um, but basically, yeah, all of like the batching and stuff is done like after by some node um, that's like outside of the Espresso protocol. But, um, but because it's not a trusted role, because you can easily prove whether or not like like someone can always prove like, oh, you didn't actually derive the state correctly. Um, hence, like that would be like a fraud proof in, in OP. Um, it's, it's okay for that to be like maybe a centralized role. Um, yeah, does that answer your question or did I miss miss the mark? No, I think that's, that's as good okay. as, as good as I could assume. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else have any more questions? All right, <laughs> thank you so much for coming out. I think that was like 30, 40 minutes of questions. So really, really appreciate you coming to give the presentation. I really appreciate you yeah. <laughs> answering these questions. No, I really, really appreciate you guys having me. Um, this is really fun. I really appreciate all the questions and um, yeah, this is great. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for coming. Uh, it was really great to see what you guys are building. Really excited mm -hmm. to see them in production soon or test that. Yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, thank you, bye. bye.